Main mammals for teachers. This is kind of, so, um, let's see. So, you know, where I normally start when I'm checking in with students in the beginning about mammals is, of course, what, what makes a mammal a mammal. Right. And um, a lot of times the kids say, well, they have fur and they provide milk to the young and they give live birth and they're warm blooded. And so it is an opportunity to kind of check in with them about, well, so what, what is fur? <laughs> like, okay, so you can tell me that they have hair or fur, but you know, do you know that those, those are proteins and do you know, what about caterpillars, for example, like caterpillars have things that look like hairs, but they're not, they're a different protein. So just they're constructed differently. Um, it's kind of as far as I go with most kids, but that's just um, fun to, for them to think about. So like, what is fur? And you know, providing milk to the young, well, you know, that really is a defining characteristic because there aren't other animals that do that. So that that's a good standalone one. And then the giving live, live birth, there's always exceptions to the rules in nature. So that's a fun one to talk about. Um, spiny echidnas and platypus are great, they all live around here, but um, that's kind of fun. And then this whole notion of warm bloodedness is, um, hard for kids to grasp. And so that's something that I don't focus on with young kids, but with the older kids, definitely, you know, talking about, so what does it mean to be having a metabolism that produces heat and um, energy? Um, and how, how is it different for animals like fish or reptiles? And what, what's different for that, for the mammals versus some of these other animals? And what does it mean for them? So what makes a mammal a mammal is a really good starting place. And often I just have the kids list these, you know, um, and write them up on the board and um, and maybe ha have them um, do some drawings, you know, of, of this and comparing them to the other animals, like in terms of, so how is this different from what a snake does in behavior and things like that, um, a reptile or an amphibian or an insect. So we have lots of mammals in Maine, and yet the crazy thing is that many adults even, much less the kids, have not seen most of these mammals. But it is, it's really fun to um, try to get some idea from them which ones they have seen and which ones they're familiar with and which ones, um, and kind of what the um, perceptions of some of these animals are. So, you know, a coyote seems dangerous to most kids. Um, you know, and do they have a conception of how big a moose or a black bear is? A lot of times they'll tell you black bear is a lot bigger than, than they actually are, um, for example. And then, you know, things like a long-tailed weasel or a river otter or a star-nosed star mole are completely unknown to these. Most kids have, they don't, you know, and they might have some suggestion of what an otter is, but they don't know. You know, I think it's important when you start talking about these mammals, like they don't know what these, what these mammals do or how they behave. Um, and so they don't know that, a, um, you know, <clears throat> for example, moles versus voles is a complete mystery to right. most kids. <laughs> you know, that voles are the ones that go in the grasses and moles are the ones that tunnel in the ground. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind when you when we're talking about the the animals themselves is sort of like, you know, giving the kids some background about what these animals really do do and what they don't do and what's um, sort of promoted as a mythology about some of these animals. Um, you know that that coyotes will attack you. Of course, they don't attack people, but um, things like that. Um, and then it's also, um, important, especially where we're so close to the coast that the marine mammals not get forgotten. So that's really fun to talk with the kids about. So like, what is, what is a whale? What is a seal? Um, and when you're talking about it in the context of what is a mammal, it's, it's I think sometimes eye opening for them to think about, well, these animals are still providing milk to their young they're doing it underwater um, and we don't see it, um, but they're out there doing this. And so that's a, that's a great thing to connect with the kids about. 
and there are so many different whales and most of us have never seen them. Um, and, and, you know, we wouldn't have an opportunity necessarily to see them either. Um, there is a great local organization called um, Marine Mammals of Maine, and they do some educational programming, uh, not a lot because they're really focused on rescue. Um, they're the organization that does rescue and, but it might be fun to check out for some of the kids to check out their website and they could learn a little bit about marine mammal strandings in Maine and, and rescue and so forth. Um, so, um, so one of the, one of the concepts again, just like with the birds, I do use sort of mammals in a category as a way to talk about, um, adaptations and other, other sort of bigger ecological concepts. And so one of the things about mammals is that they, um, all adapt to winter because none of them are mig the ones that are here are not migrating away from winter. <laughs> so they're all adapting. Um, so here we have a long tailed weasel and it's changing its color. So in the summer, it's a, known as a long tailed weasel. In the winter, that white coat um, version is often called an ermine. Not only is the coat changing color, um, to blend in with the with the um, surroundings, but the coat is actually different. So it's actually um, the hairs are more hollow, and so um, it's holding in that heat around the animal's body in the in the course of the weather change um, and getting colder. It can hold more heat, kind of like a puffy puffy parka holding in heat in the animal's heat um, and a lot of times folks um, you know, are aware of the color change being helpful in terms of avoiding predation, but the other reason for the, um, the coloration change is that in fact, the pigment takes up space in the hair. And so when they lose that pigment, there's actually, that allows for the hollowness of the hair, if that makes, does that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so they, they can't, that pigment actually takes up space in the hair. So the, in order to have the pigment in their coat, it actually, which is what helps them in the summertime to avoid predator, predation, um, they, they actually, their hairs are not hollow because they can't be because they're, they're, they're taken up with pigment. Um, which is kind of interesting. And then this is kind of an interesting pair of pictures because um, yeah, it's opposite what you would yeah, imagine. Yeah, exactly. And when what happens a lot of times is, especially if we have a time period where, where we were having no snow, we have no snow, the animals stand out. So it's actually an impediment to their survival to not have the winter conditions that they're adapted to survive in. We don't have snow, they stand out a lot. And similarly, um, you know, in the winter, in the, you know, if it's winter time and they've got grass or it's summertime and there's, a, you know, sudden freak snowstorm in June, let's say, they'll stand out. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So, uh, and then in terms of behavior uh, is the other big part of how they adapt and all, all mammals are adapting um, there are very few true hibernators, but hibernation is one aspect of of adaption, of course. Um, bears are not true hibernators. They give birth and they are sometimes active. In fact, there have been a lot of reports this winter of bears being active. Um, but groundhogs are sort of the tried and true. They're, the, they're a true hibernator and they will go into a real hibernation state where they lower their body temperature and stop their metabolic processes and they're um, just sleeping until summertime roll or spring. Are they the only true hibernators in Maine? I believe the other one, um, so large, uh, small brown bats are also true hibernators. Um, and I, I'm trying to think if there are any others. I don't think there are any others. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, so I used to work at Chwanky and I remember um, 
you know, I've seen a lot of their presentations that they do for yep. your outreach program. Yeah. I just couldn't remember. I thought there was more than one, but I couldn't remember what it was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's, it's a good talking point with the kids because we think of hibernation is like, they just go to sleep and they stay there all winter. And, and the finer point of that is not really, <laughs> you know, chipmunks are a good example and skunks also where they're really active when it's warm. If it's like today, those animals will be out foraging and then going back to a den, but, um, uh, they're, they're not, they're not going to be sleeping through this in, you know, winter entirely at all. Right. Yeah. Um, so another really useful topic to talk about with mammals, um, but you could certainly do it with any group of animals. In fact, birds would be another great one, um, is this, this concept of a niche, which is defined um, loosely as a job or role or a function in the ecosystem. So the idea being that, and I'm sure you're familiar with this from, from all your work, um, but um, the organism, plant or animal has a role in the ecosystem, a, a job that it does. And with the kids, sometimes I do um, use the analogy of, you know, in, in our society, we have a doctor and they help keep people healthy. And we have teachers who help teach people. Um, and we have um, mayors and um, I don't know, town managers of help manage policy in town and that sort of thing. So everyone's got their jobs and they're, they're doing those. And, and if you take away all the, um, I don't know, firemen, for example, you know, then you've got no one to put out the fires. <laughs> so um, in the, in our local habitats, we have a, a similar kind of situation in that these animals and plants all have a role and um, for example, you can think of like the gray fox and the red fox um, that are pictured here. Uh, so the gray fox is the one on the bottom with the black tip to its tail and the more pointy nose. And the gray and the red fox is the top one with the white tip to its tail. And um, so they're both eating rodents and they both live um, in this area and they'll live in similar habitats. They'll live, you know, in the woods. They like to hunt in, in, in uh, the edge areas and so forth. But the difference here is that the gray fox is actually a tree climber and it will um, really, yeah, so they're- <laughs> they're Did not know that actually. Yeah, gray foxes climb trees. And one of the things they do is they eat a lot of mice. There are a lot of mice in our trees, in our vegetation, and they'll also eat birds. Um, eggs and things like that in in trees. Um, and of course the red fox doesn't climb trees. So its niche is more hunting the rodents on the ground. So the most plentiful <laughs> we have here is, is the vole and they're in the grasses. So you could think of the red fox as, you know, yeah, they'll hunt other things certainly if, if there's- yeah, no, it's just that, yeah, we we have a lot of them. Okay. <laughs> you have a lot of- what voles? I've, well, no, I, we've lost pretty much all of our chickens ever to. Uh, oh. Oh. Yeah. They, they I'm sorry out. to hear that. <laughs> well, <laughs> and there was one goshawk that took a took a chicken, which that was amazing to watch. Um, yeah. Those are big birds. It was intense watching a bird take a bird like that. Like I've never watched yeah. it before. Anyway, sorry, I'm. It's not really no, no, just to the point that, you know, red foxes are opportunistic. And if a chicken shows up, you know, in its territory, it will certainly um, take advantage of that. And um, so the point being that these are two foxes and then, you know, they look similar in some ways, they act similar and so, some of their behaviors are similar, but they're, they're, some of their behaviors are different. And part of that is filling this different ecological niche. And so, you know, if you have um, two foxes, let's say, living in close proximity, you talk about competition with the kids. And, you know, so 
what does that look like if you have multiple animals that are hunting the same thing in the same area? And you could certainly set up plenty of um, kind of games where there's competition or think about, you know, a soccer game where there's competition between everybody on the team is trying to get the soccer ball. Well, you know, that only works when you, for a while. <laughs> Because <laughs> when you end up with a horde of kids around the soccer ball, all competing for that soccer ball, it can be a problem. Whereas if you give everybody a job, you know, somebody's defenseman, somebody's offense, somebody's in the middle there, um, you, you know, there's there's a um, different roles for everybody and it's lessening the competition for, in this case, food or maybe the soccer ball. Um, so there's some analogies that could be made there for sure. And similarly, the red squirrel, the gray squirrel, and you know, a lot of respects, they're very similar. They're both squirrels, they're both rodents. Um, you know, they they both live here. They both eat nuts and seeds primarily, and they'll eat some eggs. Uh, but they are also inhabiting um, slightly different habitats. So the red squirrel is more in the spruce forest, pine forest, and gray squirrels are going to be more in the hardwood forest. And so they actually have a different niche or job there in each habitat they're planting um seeds by through seed dispersal so they're going out there and gathering their their food but sometimes they forget or they cache a lot of extra seeds somewhere and so um their activities are impacting different habitats even though in a lot of respects they're very similar and so hardwood and red is the red or softwood yeah okay. yep Exactly. Yeah, and so fox and oh, I didn't hear you. Sorry, what was that? I just said I didn't know that either. It's yeah, just, that's something I didn't know. Yeah, um, but it's just it's just related to this whole concept of of roles and jobs in in a habitat or in a region, so that there's the lessening competition, um, and uh, each is very effective at its specific job. You know, red foxes are really good at hunting voles in the summer and in the winter. Um, and the gray fox is really good at hunting small rodents in trees, <laughs> which seems counterintuitive, but. Yeah, I never thought it was wild. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, okay. Well, and they're not very common. So, you know, most people have not seen a gray fox, although they are getting more common in this area right now. Um, and so people are not really familiar with them. And if they just get a fleeting glance, which is mostly what you see is, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know that they were any different in any particular ways. So, um, and then, the, you know, also similarly, the, the fox and the coyote is another example of having different roles and functions. Um, foxes are, you know, primarily, like I said, focusing on the small rodents and coyotes, um, are uh, more into, into bigger bigger prey. Uh, absolutely, a coyote will eat a bull and um, so forth. There's there's no question. But foxes don't really eat bigger things than a hare. They're you know only 15, maybe 20 pounds themselves. So they're not a big animal. Their fluff makes them look a little bigger, maybe. But so just this idea that you know different animals are doing different things is kind of interesting to. If you're having the kids report back to you about different animals, it might be an opportunity to ta ask them about, you know, so not just what's the name of this animal or what does it look like, but what does it do um, is such an important part of understanding the overall ecological system. You know, what does it do for plants? What does it do for um, the other animals in, in the area? How does, does this animal impact the, um, plant composition would be a really good question. Um, you could talk about that with any any animal, like how take a forest or or a field or a wetland and you look at the animals in that area and how do they impact the plant composition? And obviously it doesn't seem like a fox, for example, would impact plant composition of a forest or something, but they're eating the rodents. So as the rodent population goes up and down a bit, um, that's that's impacting what plants are getting dispersed and how readily and 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 where to some extent as well so it's kind of um, so angela feel free to chime in as you wish 
she might be busy. <laughs> um, and then I guess my, my advice to the, to teachers in general would be like, focus on the findable animals, you know, in your, in your area where you're teaching. So if you're like for you, Margaret, you know, if your teachers are out by the garden or in the little trail system behind the school, you know, what, what mammals are going to be there and, um, uh, not worry about the whales, <laughs> for, you know, right. too much because there's plenty of teachable moments right in the school area. Um, and so, yeah, I was yeah, that's focusing that's on squirrels and deer and mice and chipmunks and fox and so forth. Yeah. And then a part of that is that if, if you do have uh, an opportunity to take kids out there, you're going to find not just tracks, but signs, hopefully, too, um, of of mammals and other critter, critters. So uh, we do have a nice box with some rubber, um, little rubber feet. And uh -huh. uh, you can make plaster casts, you know, of the prints that the kids could take home. So that's available for teachers. And, um, you know, if you, if you, we could do a lot more on animal tracks and signs. I mean, that's a whole nother class, <laughs> you know, to kind of get into that. But I can just tell you that like, when I do talk about tracks and signs, I do a couple of things. One is um, I, I ask the kids, well, so what do I mean by like an animal sign? And I do this definitely with the youngest kids, but with the older kids too, you know, so, and they can list for me, you know, a nest, some hair, um, scratch mark on a tree or rub on a tree, a footprint, an egg or an eggshell, um, you know, a hole, a, a den, um, a kill site or um, a site where like squirrels have left a, a midden, what the leftover food parts, <laughs> you know, from, from eating. Um, so all those things that the animals leave behind and it's fun for the kids to just go through it. And it's an impressive list once you get them sort of thinking along those lines of like all the different things you might encounter and that you should be kind of looking for when you're outside that would tell you something about the activities of the, of the animals in that area. And then additionally tracks. And so what I usually do with the tracks uh, class is I, a lot of times I start with, okay, so, you know, what animal has one toe? And they'll all think for a while, hmm, you know, and so I, well, sometimes you have to feed them the, <laughs> what's well, domestic, you know, <laughs> think of a horse, you know, and then, so what animals around us have two toes? And then we talk about deer and moose, um, the fact that there used to be woodland caribou and elk in Maine, but they're, they've been extirpated, uh, but pigs and goats and sheep all have two toes as well. And then I say, well, and not only do they have two toes, but they've also got the dew claws that are up high on the leg to help them from, keep them from slipping when they go downhill or in icy conditions. So, um, you know, is that a real toe or not? And then, so what animals have three toes? And they'll often tell me birds, but um, of course birds actually have four toes as you must know from your chickens. And that last toe on the back is called a halix. And there are a few birds that, that are zygdactyl that can move um, the third toe around to line up with the fourth toe so that like a lot of our woodpeckers can do that. Um, is that just but, have to do with the way that they grip with their. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So to be able to grip like, um, for example, woodpecker needs to be able to grip on a tree trunk. And so it's helping them to have like two toes on top and two beneath. Yep. And so, you know, we can go through all the different um, iterations of how many toes and what do those toes look like. And then there's a bunch of rodents that have four toes on the front and five in the back. So like your gray squirrels and your red squirrels and so forth. Um, and I kind of graduate from talking about that to talking about, well, you know, a lot of times in the conditions like mud or sand, you might be able to see that there's a footprint there, but you can't really make out the toes. So then you need to want, you know, look at the patterns of the, of the um, tracks themselves and also the behavior, you know, if 
it's a dog like track with four toes and it's running around in circles and loopy things um, next to human footprints. It's probably a dog, <laughs> you know, and if it's a dog like footprint, but it's pretty small and it goes in a straight line and the tracks are all lined up, it's probably a fox. So um, there's a there's a lot that can be talked about, um, but really the best the best option there is to get out and try to look with the kids and see what you can find. Um, and I, yeah, I'm going to actually skip over this and kind of back out. Um, we'll talk about the activities in, in a few minutes. Um, but um, do you have any comments or, or. Uh, no, I mean, I, I have no, it's just good. It's jogging my memory of, things like that's um, what's helpful is just sort of for me remembering things I've done before um, in other contexts and one thing I mean like for example we have tons of deer tracks right now right through the garden all over the place so like that would be really good um, if you like to actually do the um, the plaster casting like it would they're really like defined prints in the, well, actually before the snow in the sort of half frozen ground, they're very yeah. like clear prints. Yes, um, nice. Just stuff like well, that. Not, yeah. Huh? It's not nice for the garden, but nice for- No, well, I mean, it, it, but it does bring up conversation because I, we just planted this orchard. I worked with Retrius and we have eight fruit trees now. Um, and, you know, I put, fencing around them and netting over them and all this stuff because I didn't know what the deer pressure would be like. So there, you know, there's things to observe, I think. And I just hadn't really thought through some of, some of the things that are right there and obvious. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's what's helpful to me. Yeah. And um, a lot of times you'll be able to see the browse marks too. If the deer are chewing on stuff, I mean, you don't even eat like um, the deer came through and ate my old, um, I left the stalks and even some leaves from my, uh, I guess it was kale. Yeah. And they, they ate the tops of it. Um, all gone. Like you just see these. Yeah. You just, little... it's just like the truffula tree. Like there's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, they're smart. I mean, they're eating, they're choosing. That's the other thing as well. This is my, maybe I don't even have this right, but I assume that they have, their bodies have some sense of what they need. And so that they may actually seek out garden refuse before other brows. I don't know. Is that true? Like, I don't know either, but I, it, you know, it, I can believe it could be true. Um, I mean, some, those plants are sur super palatable. That's why we bred them to be the way they are. So I would assume that they're pretty palatable to deer as well. I think that's just a belief I've developed from farming and seeing how they select for certain things seemingly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't know if it's real. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know if it's like scientific. But <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I don't know either, honestly, but that w would make sense. I, you know, you might be able to see where they, it'd be interesting with the kids. You could, you know, what have the, have the deer been selecting for, you know, um, if there's, 42 different plants in the vicinity of the garden and, and they've honed in on three of them, you know, it's right. kind of an interesting thing right there. Um, and do you know the game, Oh Deer? Uh, possibly. Yeah. I mean, there's um, some things that I've learned, but not used recently, like from right. my days, but yeah. Yeah, this is one that's been around a long time, but it is a super helpful teaching tool to talk about how populations of animals are impacted. Not so much, I mean, they're impacted by predation, but they're really controlled by other things like mm -hmm. um, weather, climate, resources. Um, and so basically what you do is you have two teams of kids and they line up um, facing each other. And what I do is I describe to the kids, um, you know, the, how the game is going to work. And then I have the two teams separate, but basically they have to know a couple of signs. And one of them is shelter. This is shelter. And, um, this is, this is uh, water. 
So putting your hands to your mouth is water and then putting your hands on your stomach is food. And oh, and then there's open space where you just hold your hands out wide. You can't really see me, but I'm doing this. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And um, then you make one group of kids, one side are the deer and the other side are the resources. And you um, say, okay, everybody's going to close their eyes and both groups of kids close their eyes. And I say, all right, both groups of kids turn around and, 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 you know, look, face, don't face each other. So turn around and close your eyes. And then you have to pick one of those four signs, food, water, living space, or shelter without talking to anybody. And then what happens is, the, and then I say, turn around and open your eyes, but the kids have to continue to make the sign that they were making. So food, water, living space, or shelter. And the deer are allowed to run, um, upon opening their eyes, to run and tag a resource. The resources can't move. And so what happens is they have to tag a resource that's making the same sign as they are. So it means like a deer that's looking for water has to go tag a water resource. And then if that deer is successful, they get to bring the, the um, water person, the water resource back with them. So now they're two happy deer um, they're, no, they're no longer water, but that deer is happy and it's reproduced. And now there's two happy deer. So now both those kids are on that group of that, that side. And um, there's one less child on the resource side. Okay. And if any of the deer are making signs for which there's no, that nobody else is making on the resource side. So like if, if on the deer side, somebody's making the open space sign, but no resources making the open space sign that deer was looking for open space but it didn't get it and it died and okay. so that deer is now a resource in the next round so nobody's out what's cool about this is no one's out they, they play the whole time um but what, what the event they go back and forth if if they're a dead deer they become a resource if they are um, a resource that was selected by the deer they become a deer in the next round so then there's, you know, round two is everybody turn around, close your eyes, make your sign. Everybody turn around, open your eyes. And all the kids are lined up facing each other, making their appropriate signs that they haven't told anybody else. Okay, now dear, run and tag your resource. And so it happens again. And what you do is you end up watching the, the population of deer go up and down, depending on the resource availability, um, which in this case is kind of chance because it depends on what the kids are doing. But, um, you know, if there's not enough water uh, and some of the deer need water, those deer are all going to die. And if there's not enough, um, you know, shelter, for example. So the pot, then you can ask them, well, so when the population of deer is really high, what's that called? It's called overpopulation. Because um, there's not, can, you know, you can ask the kids about that. Is, is there any chance that the deer are going to find enough resources if there's like 16, um, you know, deer lined up facing four resources, there's just no way that all those deer can possibly have their needs met. The basic needs are, cannot be met by that situation. So there's an overpopulation problem. And then um, alternatively, you know, if you've got 16 resources lined up facing four deer, so how are those deer going to do? What do you think is going to happen? Well, they're going to be fat and happy. You know, they've got probably, they could pick the resource they want. They can get the best food or the best shelter. Um, and so are they likely to reproduce? Absolutely. They're probably all going to get the resources they need and go back. Um, so that's kind of a, a nice way to talk because I think a lot of times in um, mammal programming, a lot of times people fell up not fell, they, they focus on, um, you know, the whole predation uh, thing. And even though predators do keep populations in check sometimes, uh, they're not responsible for controlling populations. They don't, you know, it's very, very rare that you would have, you know, lynx decimate the hare population. That simply doesn't happen. What happens is there's a climate related issue or a habitat related issue or a disease issue. And that's also a good thing to talk about, especially in today's situation. <laughs> right. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, that's actually an interesting point. 